Well, good morning, Rehoboth. Happy Easter. Happy Resurrection Sunday. He is alive. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Would you stand to your feet as we make much of the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. I searched the world, but he couldn't feel me. There's empty praise and treasures of faith I never enough. You came along.
Direct your attention to the baptistry this morning. Good morning, Rehoboth family. Let's give a, a hand for our worship team for leading us so wonderfully this morning. Thank you. And what better day to, to baptize on Resurrection Sunday? Can I get an amen? Um, this morning, um, we have Jade Lassiter. She is here to make a public proclamation of her faith in Christ. So I'm going to invite Jade to stand down here with me. Jade has been serving uh, in the student ministry for a lot longer than I have. She's been here at Rehoboth for a lot longer than I have. Um, and today, she is coming forth to um, publicly announce her faith in Jesus Christ. So, Jade Lassiter, have you trusted in Christ to save you from your sin? Yes. And do you commit yourself to following Christ and submitting to him until the day that you die? Yes. Well. It is in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit that I baptize you. My sister in Christ, Jade Lassiter. Now I'd like to welcome uh, JD. Would you come and give our Rehoboth family a proper warm welcome this morning? I don't know about y'all, but I'm already welcome. <clears throat> Amen. Amen. Well, hey, church, it is so good to see you this morning. If we haven't met, my name is JD, and I do see a few new faces in here, and we would love to connect with you this morning and get to know you and help you get to know us here at Rehoboth. So if this is your first time with us here at Rehoboth, stop by this table over here that says welcome after the service today. Give us some information. We've got a gift for you for your first time joining with us, and that'll help us tell you a little bit more about our church, what we have going on, as well as how you can get involved, how we can serve you, and how you can serve with us, as well as if you're watching uh, online for the first time, drop us a note, shoot us an email, a message just to let us know, and so that we can connect with you that way as well. Also, church, this Wednesday for spring break, we don't have Wednesday night activities here at uh, the church. That's April the 3rd this week. VBS is coming up. It feels like a long way off and right here all at the same time, right? Uh, I blinked and we went from Christmas to Easter. So don't blink again or we may be to Labor Day before we even uh, want to get there yet. But we got a lot of good stuff uh, going on before then. But June the 3rd through the 7th, VBS and VBS Plus, there are a few spots left to register. So if you haven't done so, go to Rehoboth.org slash VBS and it will fill up. So if you have not registered, please do that as soon as possible. Uh, women, uh, our Rehoboth women have a game night on April the 19th at 6 p.m. All women are welcome. Uh, they're going to have a finger food potluck, lots of fun. You can register uh, and get more information at Rehoboth.org slash women. Uh, also, and lastly, you know, we thank you so much for your faithful giving to the ministry of this church and what we have going on here. You can give online at Rehoboth.org slash give. You can also give in person. There are baskets in the back. You can mail, you can text using the number that's on the screen there. But I also want to mention, 
in addition to what you're contributing to just for the day-to-day, the regular things that we have going on through your tithes and offerings, which absolutely 100% continue to dig deep in that space, we also are starting our special Love Loud offering uh, this Sunday, actually, which our Love Loud ministry, this is a, a collection that we take above and beyond our normal giving that this goes towards some of the community-based ministry that we're doing. And some of the things that you're helping support when you give to our Love Loud offering is we host events and, and thank yous for first responders in our community. We, we do gifts and blessings for our teachers. We, we feed our football team at Tucker High School. We, uh, are, we respond to crisis housing requests and emergencies and things like that. And when you give to our Love Loud offering, you're participating in that and helping us be able to minister in this community in that way. So dig deep. Uh, Don't skimp in other ways so that we can keep the lights on, um, but uh, also do dig deep and help us to continue to serve our community in this way. One other thing I'll mention is that we've, some of y'all, as you came in uh, through the, the Children in Education building, we have a, a, a great photographer here with us today, and you, you may have gotten your picture this morning, but they're going to be set up outside of the sanctuary right after the service if you'd like to stop back there and get a picture taken as well. So with that, I'm going to invite you to stand and greet those around you, fist bump, handshake, and, and make people feel welcome. Buenos, buenos días. Buenos días. <laughs> I love that. Let's try that again. Buenos días. Wow, that's exciting. It always is. Resurrection Sunday. Reading from Luke 24, verses 1 through 7. But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of the sinful men and to be crucified on the third day rise. And they remembered his words, and returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary the mother of James and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. But these Words seemed to them on the idle tell, and they did not believe them. But Peter rose and ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in, and saw the linen cloths by themselves, 
And he went home marveling at what had happened. And we marvel today that we have a risen Lord. Amen? Amen. Padre Celestial, te damos gracias por todas las bendiciones que derramas sobre nosotros. We thank you, Lord, for all the blessings that you bestow upon us. And today, we are grateful to be able to gather here in your presence with this wonderful family to celebrate the risen Christ. For we ask it in the name that is above every name, en el nombre sobre todo nombre, en el nombre de Cristo Jesús. And God's people say, Amen y Amen.
empty, amen. And if the tomb is empty, anything is possible. Amen, you may be seated. Direct your attention to the screen. Jesus is nailed to a cross. Agony, shame, sacrifice, love. The sinless lamb of God is bearing the sin of the world. The sky turns dark and the earth shakes. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. His head drops to his chest and Jesus breathes his final breath. His body is laid in a borrowed tomb with a boulder and Roman centurions guarding it. But after three days, the angel rolls the stone away and the guards fall to the ground like dead men. And the same Jesus who was crucified, dead, and buried just days before is doing exactly what he promised. Jesus is walking out of the tomb alive. Today we celebrate Jesus as the risen King of Kings and the living Lord of Lords. We proclaim him as the victorious one who has conquered sin and death. He is before all things and in him all things hold together. All glory, all power, all majesty, all dominion are his and his alone. And today we declare together with Christ followers around the world that the resurrection of Jesus Christ changes everything. He is risen. Mm, indeed he is. If I were to ask you what this is, surely you would tell me it's a broom. It's got a handle. It's got a head. This is actually a corn broom. The head is not made of straw. It's actually made of corn husk. It's sewn together and then wire attaches it to the handle. Now, sure and clearly as this is a broom, if I were to ask you, what do brooms do? If you gave it much thought, you would respond, nothing. I'll demonstrate. Dance. Fly. Clean my driveway. If this podium weren't here, this broom would be on the ground, would it not? Now, we may not have any questions about what a broom is, and truly it's kind of interesting when we talk about what you use a broom for, you don't say, well, I was out in the driveway brooming, do we? I was out in the driveway sweeping. As clear as that is, and unmistakable as it is, something as simple as faith is far more complicated. For if I ask you, what is faith? Some of you would pause. Some of you, if you really got honest, would say, there was a time when I thought I knew, but I'm not sure anymore. Today, I'm going to share with you a message that I've titled, Living by Faith. What better time than on Resurrection Sunday when we especially highlight and celebrate the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ to think about and to talk about faith, and in particular, not just faith abstract, but your faith, my faith. And by that, I, I don't mean our general body of beliefs. I'm not talking about whether someone is Catholic or Presbyterian or Muslim or Mormon. I, I'm not talking about those things as a category and a collection of beliefs. I'm not saying, what is your faith? The question is actually more 
fundamental to you and to me. Do you have faith? And what is that faith? You know, as we we think about this, this entire idea of faith has literally set aflame entire continents. We don't often think about the continent of Africa as being a Christian continent, though we ought to, in the sense that the gospel has impacted large swaths of the continent of Africa. When we think of Europe, one of the things that is worth mentioning, especially as we think about faith in particular, is that there was this German priest in the 17th century, 16th century. He was a very devout priest. He was devoted. He was as committed and and as faithful as one could be, yet he was tormented. How can I know with absolute certainty that I am right with God and that I will taste eternal life when I die? He tried harder and harder and harder to be a better priest, even living as a monk. Yet, he came to a place where it was this truth that we're going to look at this morning that turned him upside down. And he went from being a devoted religious person to a person who was living his life by faith. But what is it? What what truly is faith? faith. Some might define it as Hebrews 1.11 defines it. This is as good a definition as you're going to get. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. That idea of hoping for things that are not yet is not that same idea of hoping that Florida State's going to win the national championship this year. We're going to pull for them. But I'm not betting the farm on them, or UGA, certainly not Alabama anymore. Thank God for retirements. Did did I talk about, I'm sorry. But this kind of hope, the hope that the scriptures are talking about is the kind of hope that you are absolutely 100% confident that it has already occurred even though it has not yet occurred. And that idea of hope in that same way is really what faith is. It's trusting, it's believing that when someone says this, that this is true. We see again and again and again, whether it be in social media or government or schools or even science, that what we are told one day is 100% true, the next day we find out was less than 100% true. But this hope, this faith is extraordinary It's incredible, and Easter is as important a day to talk about this. See, you and I were created, God gave us a capacity and a desire to know him. And there's nothing in this life that ultimately will fulfill that. The greatest joys, the greatest accomplishments, the greatest fulfillments, the the things that you are most known for or accomplish in this life, none of those can come anywhere close to really knowing the God who created you. The God who is majestic and wonderful and amazing and good. And he has created each of us with a desire and a capacity to know him. And yes, we fill those with all kinds of other things. We create all types of substitutes. But this nugget of life-giving truth didn't originate with Jesus in the New Testament. We find it all through the Old Testament. We'll mention a few of those places, but today we're going to turn to Habakkuk chapter 2. And if you want to turn there or scroll there, we're going to put it on the screen here in a minute. I would encourage you to take a look in God's Word. But Habakkuk chapter 2, we're going to look at verse 4. 
When, when Habakkuk wrote this, when he gave this to the children of Israel, it was more than 2,600 years ago from today. 2,600 years ago. This is an ancient, ancient text. Yet what's remarkable about it is it has endured. It is repeated and quoted multiple times in the New Testament. It is the very core and foundation of what it means to be a Christian. I, I don't know if everybody knows this. I would think probably most everybody who's seated in this room knows this. But, but going to church on Easter Sunday does not make anyone a Christian. Any more then doing good things on Monday after Easter makes you a Christian. What is the heart of genuinely what it means to be a follower of Jesus, someone who's born again, someone who's truly a Christian? We find it in this text. When Habakkuk gave this message to the children of Israel, he is living in the southern kingdom, the southern region of Israel known as Judah. The Assyrian Empire was largely in control of that area, and the Jews were subordinate to them. They hated it, and they hated the Assyrians. Yet the Jews themselves had largely rejected even their own covenant God and had begun to live and act much like all of those who were around them that were not Jews who didn't follow the one true living God. And Habakkuk is writing this prophecy that God has given him, and he's crying out in disbelief that not only are the children of Israel living like this, but that the Babylonians are going to come and conquer the Assyrians, and the Babylonians are even worse than the Assyrians, and they're going to overtake Judah. And Habakkuk is crying out, but God, how can this be? And he comes to this place where God shows him something extraordinary, which is this amazing nugget of truth, not only for them in that day, but for us in this day. In Habakkuk 2, verse 4, God's word says, Behold, his soul is puffed up, it is not upright within him, but the righteous, say this with me, shall live by his faith. What an incredible words. What incredible words as, as Habakkuk is yearning before God. How can these things be going on? How can people be like they are? And how can we know that there's going to be things that even get worse than this? And, and God, how can this be? And, and God gives him a vision and he tells him that, that he must wait and that these things are true, that God's word is true and that this truth stands above all things. The righteous shall live by faith. I'm going to share with you just three thoughts out of this. The first is we are justified by faith. The second is that we live by faith. And the third is that we wait by faith. And at the end of our short time together this morning, I hope that your idea of faith is as clear as it is that this is truly a broom. When we think about this idea of faith, we must first begin with this idea that we are justified by faith. In each of us, as I said, there is a hunger that we would know God. And regardless of where a person was born, regardless of their background, regardless of whether they believe in Jesus or not, or whether they think the Bible is true or not, all of us yearn for something more than the things that are immediately around us. We know that as good as our life might be in any given moment, that there are some things that are just not right. We know that there's real brokenness in this life, real hurt in this life, that there's real injustice in this life. We know that there are lies told and not simply by your toddler who got caught with the candy this morning after you'd told them no more. 
we know that it's not just them out there that carry this brokenness and even this deceitfulness, but we know that when we stand before the mirror and we look and as, as quick as we want to think about what we did good today, we're reminded of the things that we've done that we know are not good, that are not right, that are not okay. This verse in Habakkuk 2, verse 4 says, but the righteous shall live by his faith. Uh, Another way of translating this is that, but the just shall live by his faith. That word is the same, that that idea of righteous and just. It it doesn't mean perfect in the sense of, of, of holy perfection. It means perfect in the sense of a right relationship with God. Those who are right with God, those who have been justified with God, live by faith. And how is it that you and I, knowing that we're not all we could be or should be, how can we be right with God? How can you be right with God? What we find is that religion has done all kinds of things. And Habakkuk has even pointed to some of those incredibly religious things that his people have done. And yet they have come up short. And what God says here is in fact that the only way that the righteous can be just, the only way that we can be right with God is that we would be justified. That word justified carries with it the idea of being declared innocent as though we have never done anything. I've shared this illustration before, but it fits well right here. I got pulled over one time for speeding and and I true, truly had not been speeding. I was, was literally, there was a pack of cars that had come along with me, come along around me and they, they had overtaken me and gone on and I got pulled over. I was not happy. This is unjust. So, state trooper, state trooper comes up to the car, takes my license, doesn't even give me a chance to, to talk, to discuss, literally takes a license in my hand and goes back to his car. Comes back up, and by this time, when I see him coming up, I get out of the car, and I'm standing there, and I said, hey, I, I just want to tell you, I wasn't speeding. It was these other cars that had come around me. He looks at me and says, Have you ever been speeding and not gotten caught? (laughs) You know, it's on that day I'm wishing that I had a really different profession. (laughs) I said, well, of course. He said, shut up and sign your ticket. (laughs) Even though I was not guilty that day, I carried a sentence of guilt. The only way you and I are going to be forgiven is that if our sentence of guilt is forgiven, is taken away. But in God's economy, in in God's court, he doesn't simply say, well, don't worry about it. It's no big deal. He's a holy, perfect God. He is good and gracious and loving, but he is unwilling and unable to accept sin, even of those he loves. And so when we read in the Gospel of John that for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, what happens is that Jesus, what we are celebrating today, is that Jesus hung on that cross and your sins were placed on him and he was punished and paid the debt for my sin. When we talk about celebrating this day, it's not simply a high religious moment. It is a deeply personal religious celebration because on this day, as we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ, what we are celebrating is God's amen to Jesus' declaration. It is finished. If you wanted to write 
a check with a lot of zeros and several commas in it for our Love Loud offering today. We would receive it and do good in this community, but it won't make you justified and forgiven of your sins. If you leave this morning and say, you know, I know I need to be a little better person and I need to stop doing this and, and God, I'm not going to do this anymore. That's a good thing. Whatever this is, I'd encourage you to stop doing whatever that is. But that's not going to bring you to a place of being justified. See, that's what faith is. Faith is trusting and believing that what Jesus said he would do on the cross he did it and completed it and that the Father has received it and that you have nothing but a free gift in front of you. If you believe him, if you have faith in him, if your faith is through him to receive that gift, you too, my friend, will be justified. You'll be forgiven of your sins and not have eternal life when you die. You will have eternal life now. The question is, not do you believe the facts about Jesus? Listen, I, and, I, and I say this from time to time, even Satan believes Jesus was true. He was there. He saw it. It's not asking, do you believe that the Bible is true, that those who call upon the name of Jesus and have faith in him will be saved? It's not believing that fact is enough. That's not. Satan believes those things are true. In fact, of all the things Satan hates, there is nothing he hates more than when this message is proclaimed and when people believe this message that the just or the righteous will live by faith. Have you that faith that you have received that gift? You may have been baptized like Jade was beautifully baptized. That water in that baptistry is wonderful, expensive DeKalb County water. <laughs> it is liquid gold. If you live in DeKalb County, you know we cherish it. It doesn't save you. It cannot save you. These beautiful carpeted aisles, as wonderful as they are, if you walk them and you come to the front, even at the end of this service, some of our pastors will be here and you'll have an opportunity if you want to come and talk to one or pray with one. If you were to do, just walk down that aisle. Walking down that aisle doesn't save you. Vacation Bible School is an incredible time here in the life of the Robeth family. It's a great time for children and for families. It's a wonderful time for them to be engaged in crafts and activities and, and just have a lot of fun together. But most importantly of that, they learn about the God who has created them and about his good news. If you choose to volunteer to help in Vacation Bible School, I'm telling you, my wife will rise up and call you blessed before God. It will not save you. The only hope you have of genuinely being saved is to have faith, not that Jesus is true and real, but faith in him that he died for you. Secondly, we wait by faith. I mean, excuse me, we live by faith. Notice again what Habakkuk 2.4 says, Behold, his soul is puffed up. It is not upright within him but the righteous shall live by faith. I, I, I encounter believers from time to time who affirm with great confidence that they have trusted Jesus, not simply to be true, but that he died for them, that they might be forgiven, that, that his resurrection really is a divine and eternal affirmation of that resurrection, I mean, of that forgiveness, but they live their life as though everything depends on them, on themselves. And nothing further could be true. Absolutely nothing further could be true. You, you see, we do not get into a relationship with God only then to have to row the boat entirely on ourselves and just hope that God blows a little wind into our sails once in a while. 
That maybe he'll put a harbor out there. Maybe he'll put a dock out there. Maybe there's a refueling station out there. But man, we're out here just rowing on our own. And one day he's going to come and snatch us out of the boat and take us to heaven. If that is how you are living out your life, dear friends. We live who are justified, who have been redeemed in Christ. We live our lives by faith. There's some of you who need to live your marriage by faith. You can't fix. You put the name in. We tried that last week. That didn't work so well when we were, that's, if you weren't here last week, you missed it. Some of these folks are going to summer school. They just hadn't got the notice yet. <laughs> Some of you need to recognize that yes, God expects us to row our boat, but even rowing our boat is in total faith in him that even the strength to row, that even the oars to have in your hands, even the boat in which you sit is because of him. There are no throwaway people. Whether it's an ex or a grandchild, a boss, a neighbor, You and I are called and gifted and blessed to live this life in a broken world by faith. How is it that we can face tomorrow no matter what tomorrow brings? Because listen, there's no promise that tomorrow is going to be a great day, right? How are you going to live tomorrow when we're not sitting in this amazing, beautiful sanctuary and that beautiful lit cross is behind us and, and we've been inspired with beautiful music and encouraged with that and, and the word of God is richly in front of us and we're gathered together with the body, how are you going to live this life tomorrow? It's by faith. My, my brother-in-law, Tina's sister's husband is a farmer. Tina grew up in a farming community in Arkansas, still a big farming community. And he plants a number of crops, but one of the crops he plants is corn. For a long time, you really didn't plant corn in Arkansas. I mean, you'd plant some rows of corn for you to eat, but you didn't plant it to grow commercially because the climate wasn't ideal for growing corn. But Corn species have, have uh, been adjusted and altered, and, and so they grow a good bit of corn. And, you know, it's an amazing thing. I, I think he actually is, is, a, is a man of much greater faith than anybody who ever buys a lottery ticket or ever goes to the casinos or ever gets on an app. I, so, so, you know, in the early spring, they get out and they prepare the fields, and they, they get them ready. And then they will load these massive planters with corn kernels, dried up dead corn kernels. And they'll load these massive planters up and, and then they, they go row, driving off through the fields and, and these amazing planters, they're, they're computerized and they, they have air and they literally, they, they drive that seed down into the ground at an exact depth. And the tractor is, is, is being influenced and controlled, even though somebody's in the cab by a computer and it goes at the exact same speed. And, and these rows, I mean, they are laser straight. It's just, just remarkable. And, they, and then they put those in there and then they pull the tractors out of the field and then they wait. Now you would think a farmer at that point would go schedule his vacation, right? He's done. Of course not. Nothing's come up out of the ground yet and they're doing things to try to prevent weeds from overtaking and disease and pests and the plants begin to rise. Depending on which kind of corn he plants, it could take 60 to 120 days before those 
corn ears are at full maturity. Long time. And the whole time, they're tending the irrigation systems and they're also having to make sure a bunch of people don't come in in the middle of the night and start stripping all the corn off the ears and taking it and going selling it at the market down the street. He is doing what we are talking about here. He has no guarantee that any one of those kernels of corn will become a stalk of corn that ultimately amazing corn cobs come off of and then eventually... Broomheads come out of the husk. He is living by faith that 60, 90, 120 days later that there will be corn cobs there. You and I need to recognize that our life in Christ is not simply about coming to a worship service or a Bible study it's not simply about praying a prayer or reading. You can read your Bible all day long and not live a life of faith. I will say it this way, though. You will not live a life by faith if you're not in the Word. Is your life a reflection of the righteousness and the salvation of Jesus Christ, and whether you face great, great blessings or hard hardships, are you still walking in faith? If you can trust Jesus to forgive you of your sins, you can trust him for whatever you're going to face tomorrow morning or tomorrow afternoon. Sometimes when some of our young families are talking about that, you know, they're, they're expecting a baby and, and medical science has just advanced so much, it's just incredible and there's all kinds of testing that they want to do. Do you want to go ahead and find out if your child's going to have blonde hair or brown hair? Do you want to find out if they're going to be a, a, a UGA fan or a Georgia Tech fan? I mean, it, it's, it's just incredible the things they can find out these days. Um, I, I am overwhelmed again and again and again by our young families who the vast majority of time report, hey, we told the doctor that testing's not necessary. And the doctor will say, but what, what if your child has this malady or this missing? And over again, our families are telling those doctors, it's okay. I'm gonna love this child anyway. This is the child God has given us. Whether this child has 10 fingers and 10 toes, whether this child lives a day or lives 100 years, this is the child the Lord has given us and we're gonna love this child. That's what faith looks like. Faith like this is when you're faced with those moral um, conflicts both in, in your personal life and in your work and sometimes in your community where you take a stand and you don't have to be an obnoxious jerk, but you can say, as for me and my house, we're not gonna do that. It, it is walking in faith, trusting God. And that really brings us to this third point, it's that we wait by faith. Habakkuk 2.4 again tells us, Behold, his soul is puffed up. It is not upright within him, but the righteous shall live by faith. I, I do think sometimes people who wrestle with faith of whether they, you know, they, 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 they've read things about Jesus, they've heard about Jesus, maybe they grew up in church, but whether they're really gonna be all in with Jesus is less about whether Jesus is real and it's more about what they've seen in the faith of people around them. They've seen that friend who was a deacon who was sneaking around on his wife. They, they've seen that coworker who says she's in the church worship ministries, but we know what she does at work every week. And man, if that's the kind of person that's in church worship ministries, I don't want to be a part of that kind of church. We've seen that pastor who everything looked good on Sunday, but Monday, wow. 
And I think there are a lot of people who struggle with that. Maybe some of you in this room or watching online would say, hey, that really is where I'm at. I, I, I kind of like Jesus. In fact, I think I'd be all in if it weren't for them. And I want to talk directly to you for just a moment, if that's where you are. The reality is you have never seen, you have never seen a perfect expression of faith. You know, in Hebrews 11 that we read the first verse of, it, it's just an extraordinary text that, that talks about um, the faith of so many Old Testament believers. It talks about Abraham and it, it talks about Noah and Moses and, and it just has this long list of Old Testament saints and, and it reflects on each of them believing and having faith even though we're, we know Noah for the, the ark that he built. We know Abraham for, for you know, really being the, the father of the Jewish nation and, and all that came out of that and we know Moses. I mean, goodness gracious, we know about the movies and the tabernacle and the parting of the Red Sea and and all of those things, and, and it's just remarkable. And here's the thing, if you traced each of them and looked carefully at them, regardless of what we see on the television or any movies, every one of their lives of faith are deeply flawed. Every one of them. Every one of them. Even Mary, the mother of Jesus, even her faith at times was deeply flawed. My faith at times is deeply flawed. There have been times where my knees have not been locked strong, but they have wobbled. And if you're one of those who've questioned about, man, I, I, think, I, I think I might like Jesus. I think these things are true. I, I know I need to be forgiven, but I don't want all of this. Here's the good part. You're not being invited or challenged to have faith in this. The call is for you to have faith in the one who is redeeming all of this. The, the call is to trust the one who said it is finished and he had paid for all of your sins. The call is to trust that not only has he forgiven you and he will work in your life to redeem you and to heal you and to sanctify you, all these things. But here's the, here's the other part of the good news. He's working in their life too. He's not done yet. And the reality is he's not calling you to believe in them. He is calling you to believe in him. And then to live a life walking in faith faith that God will bring justice when there has been deep injustice and to wait on him to trust that it will come in his time it, it, it is a call to believe on him and walk in that when your prayers have gone unanswered in a room this size full and, and online, I know there are people who are hearing this message right now that you have cried out to God again and again and again and again and God seems to have not heard you. And the call is to have faith, to trust him. A good God always does good. A good God always does good in good timing. I can trust God when he is on my schedule, but will I trust him on his schedule? To live a life of faith and wait on him. Um, when we think about this broom. My, my grandfather, my dad's dad, he and my grandmother lived way off in the country in northwest Florida and a lot of dirt roads then. There's still quite a few today, largely a farming community. And uh, there were times my sister and I would go spend in the summer some time with my grandparents and, 
And uh, I loved to, if my grandfather was going someplace, I wanted to be with him. He was my larger than life hero and he, he was just a big man and, and uh, he'd been a, uh, uh, in the military and uh, you know, he, was just, he was just my hero. And wherever he went, I wanted to be with him. And one of the things I always thought was cool, he, he always had a Ford pickup truck and he always had a gas pedal that was that barefoot with the toes on it. And I always just thought that was the coolest thing. And um, one day he was taking me, we were actually going to my aunt and uncles who live in a in a, a small town a little bit away from there and we were taking some dirt roads to go back to where they were and we passed this old house that the trees had grown up in and, and it was just kind of overrun and the house was kind of collapsing and had a, you could still tell there was a front porch on it but it was, you couldn't have lived in this house at all and my grandfather started telling me a story that when he, because he grew up right there in that community that when he was a young man that uh, he was on an old horse one day going down that road and the people who lived there, the man and the woman, they were out on the front porch and they were fighting. And my grandfather thought, hmm, that's not the way you're supposed to treat a woman. My grandfather's a big man. He got off the horse, he walked up to the front porch and he knocked the guy out. One punch, I mean out cold. He's standing there looking at him and had no idea what was about to happen. The woman had a broom sitting over here. It it didn't have a pine handle on this. I suspect if I really got down hard on this, I could break this. This this was a thick oak handle. Some of y'all remember those kind of brooms. They had multiple purposes. He said she hit him so hard over the top of his head that he literally fell off the porch, fell down to the ground, was semi-conscious. When he finally came to, he said, she's over there trying to take care of her husband. And and I said, well, granddaddy, what did you do? He said, I got on my horse and I rode off. (laughs) Um, This broom has a lot of purposes for it. You can use it to sweep with. There's a game you can play called broom ball. It's a, it's a bit like volleyball, but you use brooms and a ball. I think you have to wear helmets and stuff with it. But nonetheless, sounds like a fun game you could play. But a broom also has another use. And there's some of you sitting here today that there was a time in your life where you'd go, Troy, I really used to believe But man, I've lost my way. I've lost my footing. And and you've been talking and and the Lord has just shown me, I'm trusting more of me than I am of him. You you don't need this end of the broom. You need this end of the broom. And you need to do some business with your flesh and with Satan this morning. Today is the day to turn to him again afresh and say, I believe I trust you. I not only trust that you died for me, I trust you in what I'm facing right now. I trust you with my cancer. I I trust you with the finances. I trust you in this relationship. I trust you, I trust you, I trust you. There's some maybe sitting in this room, maybe online, you've never believed. Well, I mean, you believed these things were true. But you've never genuinely trusted Jesus to save you. You you might be that kind of person who's been saying, well, I'll do it tomorrow. I'll do it next week. Once I get this cleaned up. Yeah, I was baptized. Listen, you need to take this into the broom and you need to do some business today. You, You need to beat self back into the corner And today, trust Jesus to save you. Will you bow your heads and close your eyes? Nobody looking around. Will you today trust him? 
Because God's word says, for the just will live by his faith. I'm gonna pray for you in just a moment. And at the end of our service, some of our pastors are gonna be here at the front. If you wanna come and pray with one of them, even on this Easter Sunday morning, come and pray with them. If today is the day you wanna cry out, oh God, I feel like I'm a long way away from you. There was a time when I I thought I trusted you, but I've slipped and I've fallen. And today I turn my life afresh to you. I trust you. I believe in Jesus Christ and I will walk with him. Maybe for the very first time, today's the day that you would cry out and pray, God save me. I believe Jesus did what only he could do. He paid the debt for me. And I receive that gift. Father, thank you that you have given this extraordinary revelation of faith so many centuries ago that is still valid and true today. It is sacred, holy truth. Adam and Eve yearned for it. Noah yearned for it. Abraham and Sarah yearned for it. Mary and Martha yearned for it. Oh God, today we yearn to live a life of faith. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. I was a wretch. I remember who I was. I was lost. I was blind. I was running out of time. And sin separated. The breach was far too wide But from the far side of the chasm You held me in your side So you made a way Across the great divide Left behind heaven's throne To build it here in And there at the cross, you paid the debt I owe. Broke my chains, freed my soul. And for the first time, I had hope. Thank you, Jesus, for the blood of life.
You brought me from the darkness into glorious light. Amen. And we say thank you, Jesus. Amen. Can we tell him thank you, Jesus? Thank you. I told you that Satan hates this message. He's going to do everything he can to tempt you to forget about this message by tomorrow morning. He's going to do everything he can to tempt you to live any other way than in Jesus this afternoon. As you go, celebrate with family, friends, however you're going to celebrate this resurrection day of Jesus. But do so remembering the just shall live by faith. Sing with us as we close out. This concludes our service.